We are doing, you can't you say the word of God is like a filler. <laughs> it's not a filler, right? <laughs> but we're sort of like, before we go into our next book, which we're going to study in depth, we are going through, I'm going through um, some of the Psalms. And we've done Psalm 1. Praise the Lord. My favorite Psalm. Just saying. Um, we've done Psalm 2. And today, because, you know, I'm not going to do Psalm 3. Um, but, you know, I just thought about Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is another one of my favorite Psalms as well. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Psalm 19. If I just say Psalm 19, you go, yeah, Psalm 19. Anyone? Oh, yes, Boney M. Anybody? You need to be, you need to be north of 50, right? <laughs> we'll get to that bit at the end, all right? We'll get to that bit at the end. And so Psalm 19, I will be reading from the New King James Version if you have your Bibles. And I like to hear the sound of those, the paper kind of like ruffle, you know. People have these phones and they just kind of like clicked it. I'm not in that school. I'm not part of that stable, you know. And if you haven't got a Bible, why not? <laughs> Question. Anyway, that's another story. Psalm 19, reading from Luke King James Version, says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than, than, than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and a honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen? Amen. Amen. So the last bit is the Boney M bit, if you're not familiar with that. And you can Google Boney M afterwards if you're not sure who Boney M is. But anywho, verse 1 tells us that this is to the chief musician. So what do we think this is? It's a song, right? It's a song. Now, when, when you, we generally read Psalm 19, do you read it as a song? We don't. We just read it as text, right? But it's actually a song. And, you know, basically the music sheet would have been given to the, the top musician, right? To the chief musician to play. And just because you're going to enter into my world for a small moment, just because the way my brain works, right? It's like... You know, I see the Psalms, when, especially when it says to the chief musician, I see them like original dub plates. <laughs> now, I see them like dub, anybody know what a dub plate is? We all know what a dub plate is, right? All right, you could be schooled afterwards. So it's like the original dub plate. And if you think about the original dub plate, I think Psalm 119. Now, does anybody know how many verses Psalm 119 has? 176, 176 verses. And so when I think about Psalm 119, I feel about there's a beat. I won't do a beat, but maybe I will do it. Like a beat. Boom, paka, boom, boom, paka. And then everybody has their turn of doing their, their little rap, their little cipher over there. So that's how I kind of like see Psalm 119 because it's the stringed instruments, right? There's a beat. 
And everybody seems like, all right, your turn, my turn, I step in. This is my little bit. Do you know what I mean? How can a young man cleanse his ways by listening and living according to God's word? You see, your word is like, the entrance of your word brings light and brings wisdom, understanding to the, you see, it's like, you've got to read your Bible like that. You'd be inspired. You'll be like, oh, the word of your Lord. You won't read it like that. You see, you'll get into it. Anywho. Not sure if anyone's happy in there, but it's okay. Bless. And so, I see it as the different poets of, their day, of, of the day jumping in. And so, here we see David. David is, is writing this song. And I can just imagine David, he just, you know, as he gazed into the heavens... He was inspired to write and compose this particular psalm. And he writes it about the wonders of God and how, you know, he writes this and he divides his thoughts into, into two different sections. And so as we go through it, we're going to see he has a, a thought about two books, really. The book of creation and then the book of God's word, the books of his word. And so, in a sense, David gets into the groove, if you can see it like that. And it's like, and he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, fortunately, yesterday, um, you know, uh, Wayne and, and Andrew and Wayne's son-in-law, we was out on a bike ride, right? And unlike today, where it's really overcast and everything, yesterday... The sun was just amazing. It was glorious. You know, when I'm out on my bike on days like that, I just think about, Lord, it's just glorious to be out in your creation, riding, taking in the sun and just the beauty of, you know, that's, the, that's how I think, you know. And so I can see how David basically, as he was just sitting around, meditating, looking up at the glorious sun, the sunshine and everything, he just thought, the heavens, it's just declaring the glory of God. And it made me think that, see, we were out yesterday, but how many people yesterday probably didn't pay any attention to the fact that it was actually a glorious day? It was cold, but it was a glorious day. And how often do we just wake up in the morning and it's a glorious day, but we don't even give it a moment's thought. We just get on with whatever we're doing. And I remember sort of like, again, my own personal testimony is that when the Lord, by his grace, you know, brought me into his kingdom, I remember the sky looked bluer. It just looked bluer. I could hear those birds, tweet, birds tweeting a bit louder. And I was just more appreciative of, of God's creation. That's just me. I was just like, yo. So I try to capture those moments where I just appreciate, you know, we hear and I'm digressing, but here we've got foxes and squirrels and, you know, in the dustbin, sometimes I'm going to empty the dustbin, a squirrel jumps out, away, frightens me, my heart's going to jump out of my chest. But I look at it, I just think, wow, God's creation. You know, just taking those moments just to take those things in, and we can just take these things for granted, right? But, but David is taking this moment to say, the heavens, the heavens are speaking. It's declaring something, and it's declaring the glory of God. And so David uses the word heavens here, which is shamayim in the Hebrew. Now, it's an interesting word because um, it could mean the sky, singular, and all that we see during the sunlight, during the daylight, but it can also mean the sky, plural, okay? So it's interchangeable. And so it could also mean the solar heavens, what we are able to, to visually see what is visible at the nighttime with the moonlight, the stars, you know, the moon. You know, if you've got one of those telescopes, you could maybe see some of the planets in there. And so he's speaking about the solar heavens. But I wouldn't stop there. I would say that, that David's also speaking about what we would call the third heaven, right? The third heaven where, where God resides, where the, where, where the Godhead resides and all the angelic hosts. And David's saying that the heavens declare the glory of God. And just sticking there for a moment, you know, 
I just think what a wonderful declaration it is. You know, I've touched upon it already, but from seeing wonderful blue skies, who's ever been, maybe not in England, but who's ever been on holiday and you witness just a, an amazing sunset and you just take it in, you're like, wow, that was heavy. You know, if you're fortunate enough or unfortunate enough because it's freezing cold, maybe you've seen the Northern Lights and you think, wow, that's impressive. You know, when you think about, maybe you don't think about it anymore, but a rainbow. When we see a rainbow in the sky, and sometimes we see a double rainbow, and that's really impressive. But when we see the rainbow in the sky, you know, it, it reminds us of God's promise that he would never flood the world again, right? You know, that's been hijacked now, hasn't it? The, the rainbow and the rainbow colors has been hijacked now, but its original purpose is God's reminder in the heavens. I'm not going to flood the earth again. What about when we see, if we take a moment, we see, you know, God's creation, all the different birds flying in the, the great expanse. You know, do you take a moment just to see how the birds sometimes fly and, you know, how they maneuver in sequence and everything. It's just, yo, the heavens declare the glory of God. The solar heavens, I said, I touched upon it, you know, the wonders of the stars and the, and the planets. And in Genesis, God says that the, the, the stars were given for signs and for seasons. And the lovely thing about that is that mankind can't get his grubby hands on the stars and, <laughs> and the planets, can he? They, they're up there. They're fixed. And God says they're given for, for signs and for seasons. And so the heavens declare the glory. Or what about the third heaven? What about where the Godhead is, where the angelic host resides? I mean, what about that? Does that declare the glory of God? Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. What's a seraphim? Each one had six wings. Six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me. For I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. And so Isaiah gets this vision of the third heaven. And what's the third heaven doing? It's singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. It's declaring God's glory. What about the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 4, a bit of a long piece of text, but I'm sure you'll appreciate it. He says, immediately, this is John speaking, I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne set where? In heaven. And one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Can you guys visualize this? I mean, does it make any sense here, Ed? Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thundering, thunder, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass, a sea of grass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes, in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures each had six wings, full of eyes around within. And they did not rest day or night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
Wherever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders, elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. A long portion of text, but could you visualize that? John's caught up in the spirit, and in his day, he's trying to communicate what he's seeing. And that's the best he could do. And even now, we're trying to like, what does that look like? You know, angels and eyes are in their front and eyes in the back and six wings and they flew. But whatever it is, heaven declares the glory of God. And so... I'm referencing this all just to say, if we are able just to take a moment out of our busy day, you know, we've all got our schedules, we've all got our structure. You know, if you're a parent, yeah, you've got to get the children to school. But just take a moment just to look up and think about God's creation. Thinking about how the heavens declare the glory of God. And if you take a moment, you cannot look up and, and in my opinion, you cannot look up and believe in evolution. Mm -hmm. I just came about. (laughs) You know, you cannot think of being an atheist. I mean, nothing can produce nothing, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have something, right? So let's take a moment to look up and see that the heavens and the heaven of heavens declare the glory of God. And when it says it declares, it says it's like it's shouting. It shouts, it screams of the glory of God, the glory of his creation. And it says, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Now, most scholars just believe that Dave is just repeating what he's already just said. But in my mind, I think that David's just kind of like adding, you know, those, those rolling hills. Mountains, the way God's just created this thing, you know, just to glory in it, to bask in it. Day unto day utter speech, and the word that, well, the phrasing in Hebrew for speech, it means to gush out. So day unto day, it, the speech is gushing out. That's the, what is trying to be communicated here. And, the, you know, it's, The declaration is gushing out through this book of creation. And night unto night reveals reveals knowledge. And so the experience of what we see visibly by day, again, should make us want to acknowledge the glory of God. And every night as we gaze into the stars, it should make us want to discover more and more about the knowledge of God. You know, to meditate on his word day and night. He says, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So no matter where you are on planet Earth, everyone, you know, is exposed to the wonder and the glory of the speech of creation. And each day, it should make us want to live for God. And each night, it should remind us that there is something greater than ourselves something beyond this planet something something greater than us and that's what romans one in a sense says for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse and so, creation, verse 4, their line has gone out through, through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Now, many people have debated about this and said the Bible has pretty much got it wrong because, you know, um, the original thought was that Well, the earth 
goes around the sun, right? Right, but the original thought was that it was the other way around, right? And so people say that, ah, oh, the Bible's kind of like not technically right. And, but interestingly, which is interesting, is that scientists now say that the sun has its own orbit. And so the, the sun sort of like circles around within its own orbit. I don't know the technical vibe of it, but in a sense, which will make what David says right. You see, so that's just a modern thing which people have been looking at right now. I'm not a scientist, I don't know. I just thought I'd let you know that, right? <laughs> but if we look at what David's saying here, poetically, David, and remember, it's a song. It's poetry. And poetically, David likens the night sky as, as like a tabernacle that houses the sun while the sun goes on its circuit until the sun is ready to be revealed again. Amen? And then he says... Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end. So the sun, S-U-N, rises in the, you sure? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and it sets in the, all right. <laughs> and so as the sun, S-U-N, rises in the east and sets in the west, you know, it reflects the sun, S-O-N, <laughs> basically giving light to all, to all men. That's what it's reflecting here. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. And so, you know, creation speaks and it speaks loudly. And basically what I would say David is, is, is communicating as well is that there's no one, you know, people could say, oh, what about, what about the guy in the deepest depths of the Amazon jungle who's never heard the Bible? What about that guy? You know, is he going to be accountable for, for his soul? It, well, he has the book of creation. He can look into the sky and see that there's something, someone greater than him or her. You know, and so we are without excuse, as the scripture says. And so they cannot see that the glory of, that they have not seen the glory of God and that there is no one or nothing greater than them and so the heavens declare the glory of God now that's the book of creation if you could take a moment to think about it um anybody watch the blue planet you like that stuff I mean when you see how can the evolution bring all that stuff about come on <laughs> I mean come on is it Sir David Attenborough and he's not a believer you'd think someone who's done all that work all that research you know done all those programs and think this cannot come about by chance but no he's not a believer but blue, the blue planet it's amazing when you see how you know creation is just brought together it's beautiful but anywho david writes this song about <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry david writes this song he starts off by singing about creation, declaring the glory of God. And then what he does is in verse 7, which we know as verse 7, it's like he shifts gears. He shifts gears. And in a sense, we could say he sort of like goes into some choruses. And he tells us that not only does creation speak of the mighty works of God, but the word of God also speaks of his glory. But the word of God now speaks of, of his glory in a more profound way. Because... It speaks of the covenant loving God of truth. And the covenant loving God of truth who speaks to his creation in a very personal way. And so what David does is he begins to give us a variety of statements, choruses, if you will, of God's word. And with these statements, he, ha he adds what God's word does. And he does this to show the completeness of God's word. Now, you're going to have to follow in your text to, to see what I'm, where I'm going. So the statements are the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. Now, the key phrase in what I just mentioned is of the Lord. 
Who is it of? It's of the Lord. And so that's the key phrase there. The quality of God's words are, you know, we're going to look at it, is that it, it brings perfection, surety, it's right, it's pure, it's clean, it endures, it's true, it's righteous. The outworking of God's word is it converts the soul, makes wise the simple, light, enlightens the eyes, and warns the servant of God. So, from verse 7, the law of the Lord. Now, David is speaking of the Torah. The Torah of Yahweh. And so he mentions the, the Torah of Yahweh because David wants to make it clear exactly which Lord he, we're talking about here, right? It's Yahweh. The law of Yahweh is perfect. It's perfect. Converting the soul. And so what David is singing about is that the entirety of God's word is perfect. Perfection in the sense that it is it is is able to bring someone to God, is able to convert the soul. Now, you may like Harry Potter. You may like some of these other novelists, but when you read those books, I would bet that they do not convert the soul. But God's word is able to, to convert the soul. Now, when David wrote this, I think I mentioned this before, when David wrote this, he, he did not have the full counsel of God. He didn't have the prophets, you know. Um, he didn't have Ecclesiastes or Proverbs, but he had some Proverbs, but they were the works of his son, right? He didn't have the major prophets, the minor prophets. He didn't have the New Testament. What he had was basically the five books of, of Moses, the Torah, that's why he references it. He, he may have had the book of Joshua. He may have had the book of Ruth. But that's what David's working from. And David's saying, well, that's what I got. <laughs> and what I got is perfect. And it, what I have at my disposal is able to convert the soul. Interesting. You know, it's able to, to bring about change from within, from the inside, inside out. Change to the soul, change to the, the nefesh in Hebrew. And what's the soul? Now, you know, we say that the soul is your, is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And so the word of God is able to bring balance to the thought life. Anybody need a bit of balance in their thought life? Anybody just find that their mind just drifts and wanders and it's gone? Before you go, oh, come back. Maybe even now I'm speaking and you're thinking about dinner or you're thinking about what's the two o'clock football match on today or, or you're thinking about whatever it may be. Oh, I've got to go a bit to work later. Or, oh, have I got this children's uniform ready for tomorrow? I mean, you're probably, your mind's somewhere else. Amen? Amen. Capturing your thoughts. You see? So the word of God is able to bring balance to your thought life. The word of God is able to let us know how to exercise our will. I want to so badly do this thing over here. But God's word says, I shouldn't. What do I do? It's the fight. Follow your own will. Follow God's will. My own will. <laughs> God's will. How do people have a battle every day? How many people had a battle if they wanted to be here today? Maybe. See? Exercising the will. The word of God is able to bring about change and help you to exercise your will. What about the emotions? You know, what does the word of God do to our emotions? Now, again, some people are so focused within their emotions. It's like, if I feel God, God is with me. And if I don't feel God, God is not with me. Is that Bible? That's not actually Bible, is it? I am with you to the end. You know, I'm with you always, even to the... So he hasn't left. 
So whether I feel God or I don't feel God, God is still God. Now, he gives us emotions in order to be able to feel and to express ourselves and, and be touched and everything. And emotions are beautiful. But someone who's tipped too far in their emotions, if they feel good, they do something. If they don't feel good, they won't do something. Really, our yes should be yes. and our no should be. Well, if we decide to do something, it doesn't matter how I feel. I've decided to, to do it, right? So that the word of God is able to convert the soul so it doesn't line up with necessarily what we want to do, but will line up with what he wants us to do. It's perfect. It can convert the soul. And so as we study the word, the hope is that we become more like Jesus, right? And we move from one aspect of change to another aspect of change, as the scripture says, from one aspect of glory to another aspect of, of glory, right? We're being changed because the word of God is perfect, converting the soul. And so as we're going through this process of change, you know, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, for now we know in part, and we prophesy, if you prophesy, in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. So, so it's like we're on this journey and we're figuring it out, right? And we're figuring it out. We want to be more like Jesus. That's the goal. That's what we're aiming at. And as, as we get closer and closer to Jesus, you probably won't even realize it, but you'll be looking more and more like Jesus. When somebody cuts you up in your car, you say, God bless you. Praise the Lord. You know. When somebody wants to argue with you, you're kind of like, Do you know what? It's all good. I'm sorry. You can have your way. Go the extra mile. Andrew said it today. Turn the other cheek. All that stuff, which is hard because it goes against what I want to do, right? Somebody does you a wrong. You want to do them a wrong back. Somebody steps to you, you want to step to them. A lie? But the word of God says, no, nah, you got you to gotta act differently around there. It's able to convert the soul. It's able to put that verse of scripture in your head to say, ah. Oh, okay I so want to just get at this person and cuss them but a soft answer turns away Ralph you sure you want me to use that one right now Lord yes yes Patrick see it's hard right but as I prayed earlier this is what the word of God does for the word of God is living and powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. How do you divide between soul and spirit? And of joints and marrow. And is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? It's able to discern what's going on in here. We can fool people, put on a mask. But the word of God's like, nah, I got you. I got you. I got that light shining down on you. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must. What word did I just say there? We must give an account. See, the word of God is, is perfect converts the soul it opens you up it opens us up and it gives brings us to the point where do we want to agree with god or we want to just carry on our own word in our own way the testimony of the lord is sure and so it's just talking about the surety of god's word you know the surety of god's word psalm 119 verse 89 says forever how long's that how long's forever it's a long time right <laughs> Forever your word is settled in the heavens. Forever. How long's that? A long time. A long time. <laughs> Did I say that already? <laughs> oh, you don't get the joke. All right, cool. Carry on. It's a long time. It's settled in the heavens. And so the surety of, God, of God's word, which is settled forever, what's it able to do? To make wise the simple. To make wise the simple. 
You see, it's interesting that maybe you're not the most educated person in the world. Maybe you haven't got, you know, I was going to say O-levels, but again, that's, you have to be a certain age to know about O-levels, right? <laughs> GCSEs. Um, A-levels, maybe you haven't got a degree. Maybe you've got that stuff. But you know what? You know the word of God. And when you're in a conversation, you're talking to anyone, it just seems like you're, you're anybody just felt like they can hold their own because they know God's word and they know the perspective on life. Any, anyone? Yeah, just you, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I find that sometimes I have conversations with people and I think it's, that's only because I study God's word. That is simple. The perspective I have. And so it shows that it makes wise the simple. And I'm a very simple person. I'm a young buck from South London trying to ting. So make wise the simple. Psalm 119, 139. We'll get to it in a second. So make wise the simple. We know that people can be wise, as I said, in the world's eyes, but true wisdom is to, is to know God, right? True wisdom is to know God. I'm going to take it a step further. True wisdom is to know God, but it's also to be known by God. Because you can't just say, oh, me and God are cool out here, right? Me and God have got our own personal relationship. Are you walking in obedience? Are you walking how he wants you to walk? Does he know you? Or is he going to turn around and say, bruv, sis, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, because I never, ever knew you. So it's not just good to know God, are you known by God, right? So we continue. The statutes of the Lord are right. The statutes of the Lord are right, morally right. You know, the world has just gone mad right now with its moral, moral standards, right? It's crazy. What's right, what's wrong? So it's morally right, it's practically right. And when we look at God's word being right, that's the standard of what should be right. It says rejoice in the heart. When we know we're standing on truth and what is right, it just brings joy to your heart. And again, like we're living in a time where you may feel that what you know to be right is something you cannot <coughs> verbalize. <laughs> In certain areas, in certain situations, you kind of like got. Yeah. You get me. Yeah. You got to hold your tongue, keep your peace, because you know you might get cancelled, <laughs> you might lose your job. But even in those times, I'm sure you feel that what you know that God's word is right. So even if you out there, them out there might cancel it, I know I'm right with God. I'm good with God. Because it's right, you see? And so the statutes of the Lord are right, morally right, practically right. Rejoice in the heart. It brings joy to our innermost being. The commandment of the Lord is pure. So David starts speaking about purity in God's word. When he thinks about purity, he's like, the commandment of the Lord's word. Ah, oh, it's just so pure. In everything which God communicates to us we know that there's purity there even in those those harsh words those harsh judgments you know when we read in the old testament they think lord why did you say that you know but somewhere in the line along the line we may not totally understand it but there's purity there he says it for a reason he is just he is righteous he's pure and so we have to just trust in that and with god's purity it says enlightening the eyes and this is where I was talking about Psalm 119.139. The entrance of your word brings light and understanding to the simple. The fear of the Lord. And so this isn't a fear that, that we're scared of God. We even know we should be scared of God. We should be shook. But it's not that fear where we're scared of God. It's, it's the, oh, the wonder, the awe, the beauty, the majesty of who God is. Oh, you're, you're incredible. You know, the fear of the Lord is clean, <laughs> clean, clean, enduring forever, clean. Anybody bought a nice 
white t-shirt and you just wear it, you feel so good because it's lovely or white and then you wash it once. <laughs> it's not so white anymore, right? <laughs> you know, it kind of like fades. It's like the colour just goes. Do you get me? You know, sometimes I'm like, I, I, I want to wear the white top, but I don't want to wear it because I don't want to get it dirty. So I'll never wear it. I'm thinking, it's a top I should wear. Anyway, that's me. But do you get my point? It fades. But he's saying here, it's clean. It doesn't fade. It doesn't fade at all. You know, when, when John was on, on, the, on the mountain and he saw Jesus, you know, transfigured, it was like, it was, it, I think Mark says that it was whiter than any launderer could, could, could make it white. It's like, it doesn't fade. Whew. It's clean. It doesn't fade. It endures forever. And how long's forever? A long time. A long time. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And so, you know, David's like judgments, truth, righteousness, you know. The judgments of the Lord are true. And again, I just thought about it and I think that the Bible doesn't claim to be a science book. But it agrees with science, right? It doesn't claim to be a history book. But it agrees with history. And so, you know, again, you have all these people saying the Bible's not true, the Bible's not right and everything. And then tutus in Israel, they'll dig up some, something and it's like, oh, yeah, the Bible was true. <laughs> you know, it was right in this Dead Sea Scrolls, for example. You know, oh, right. So we see how the word of God is is so wonderful in all these areas. So, you know, how are we doing with these things? You know, if we have to ask ourselves the question about how are we doing with these qualities of God's word, you know, how are they being outworked within our lives? You know, his perfection. How's his perfection being outworked? You know, when, you, when we have a, a choice where we can, again, I just used the example, we can give a soft answer. How often do we buck with someone and argue with them? How often when somebody wants to take liberties, do you think this person's taking absolute liberties with me, you know? Do we say, it's cool, I'll go the extra mile? You know, has, has God's word actually outworking itself within our lives? You know, his surety, his purity, his cleanliness, his endurance, his truth, his righteousness. You know, is it converting the soul? Is it making wise the simple? Is, it, is his word bringing light? Is his word warning about dangers? Verse 10 says, more to be desired than, than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. You see, here what David is doing, he's touching upon the value of God's word. In that most people, I would say, they live their lives and they will prefer gold and riches and wealth more than they would prefer God. That's what most people would do. And you think about David's life, and when I think about David's life, you know, there's lots of different stages of David's life. Such a wonderful character within the scriptures to do a study upon. But you see, David being that shepherd boy who was overlooked, you know, Jesse, how many sons you got? Oh, here's my sons. I'm looking for, here's my sons. Oh, yeah, I've got one in the field. Over there, his name's David, but surely you can't want David, you see? Goes from shepherd boy, even when his brothers were going to fight battle with Goliath, and his dad just sends him with some food and sends him with a message. It's like, he's not really being thought of, is he? Different stages, and then he's, he's, he's anointed king. So he's the king, but he's, he can't take up the throne because Saul's there, right? And so he comes and he's in Saul's house, and then Saul hates him. Maybe because he could play that stringed instrument good and he was popular and David has killed his now Saul has killed his thousands but David has killed his tens of thousands he's like and he's just it's irking at Saul and Saul's like I just hate this guy you know I just hate him do you know what I mean and we can be like that sometimes isn't it like look at other people and think why is that why are they getting that and I'm not getting that do you know what I mean we can that thing can mess with us some you see so but anyway that was Saul that was Saul no, no, that was Saul's relationship. That, that's David's relationship with Saul. But then David's on the run. He's a fugitive. And then David comes 
back to being king. And there was even a point that his son went against him, Absalom. So there's enough going on. Don't watch Coronation Street. Pick up your Bible, right? But lots of things going on. But when, when I think about David and, you know, all the different stages of his life, I don't often think of that. I see him as a king, but I don't see, see David as being this flamboyant, rich king. Do you know what I mean? I see, da I see Solomon like that, but I don't see David like that. But David had crazy money. He had crazy wealth because it was David who funded the building of the temple. It wasn't Solomon. David funded it. So I say all that. I've gone a long way around the houses to say that. But David is telling us his attitude towards riches compared to God's word. The value of riches compared to the value of God's word. And he says, more to be desired are they than gold. And he's not just going to say that. I mean, I don't know much about gold. Yea, the much fine gold. Now, again, if you watch any westerns or anything, you know, people gold isn't something you just go and pick up a piece of gold you have to mine for gold you know the process of getting gold is is a laborious process and these so the value of someone having to to go and dig up gold to actually gain gold nuggets or whatever it may be is a process and david's saying like forget that dig into god's word that's the better option more to be desired than any gold yea they're much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. So the reference to honey now, remember, they didn't have Sainsbury's. They didn't have sticker bars and, and all those things there. So honey is like a, a, luxury, a luxury thing. And basically what this is actually a reference to is is the pleasure, sensual pleasure, which you could get from eating something nice, in a sense. So how it makes you feel. And so God's word is sweeter than any sensual pleasure we could think of. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. And so what, what he's talking about now is like, look, as we go through life, I've referenced it before, but got, there's going to be many stages where we want to do our thing, our own thing. And God's word, if we're reading it, if we're exposing ourselves to it, will give us those correction points, those warnings, if you want to take heed to them. And if you take heed to the warnings in God's word and you live your life according to God's word, David says here, he's singing here, in keeping them there is great reward because you know what as i said the word of god will expose ourselves it will expose our thought life it would warn us from stumbling in sin and again if we take heed to god's word there is great reward who can understand his errors so what david is reflecting upon here is the times when he did not take heed to God's words, to God's warnings. And maybe he didn't take heed because maybe he didn't understand what the warning was. <clears throat> Ever been in a situation where you're not quite sure and you don't purposely m want to make an error or make a wrong choice and everything, but you end up making the wrong choice, the wrong thing, you end up in sin, you don't really figure, you can't really figure, how did I get here? <laughs> so he's like look as best as you can stick to the word of God because it will help you in those situations and so who can understand his error so in even in those situations where we make bad choices we fall into sin guess what we're still responsible for the choices we make the false faults we make and these things before God still need to be atoned for. And so 
David, within his song here, his cry, his prayer is, cleanse me. You know, who can understand his errors? Lord, cleanse me. You know, cleanse me. David is recognizing, I cannot cleanse myself. The secret stuff, me and you know about. Because they're in my head. They're in my heart. The person next to me doesn't know what it is, but you do. Because nothing's hidden before you. Everything's naked and open. Lord, cleanse me from secret thoughts. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. So the presumptuous sin is the ones where you, you know you're doing I know I'm going to sin. I'm going to do it. Ain't nothing stopping me from sinning out here. And the process of sin. Is that. Sin in a sense. Has a process right. I'm um, sorry. So keep your servant also from presumptuous sin. The things that I know better about. But still choose to sin. So keep me back from sin that I'm fully aware of and I'm tempted by. Fully aware of it. I know I'm going to be tempted by this thing, but I'm going to do it anyway. And so the pattern, you know, usually goes like this. Sin goes from a passing temptation to a chosen thought. From a chosen thought to a chosen object of meditation. From a chosen object of meditation to wishful fulfillment. From wishful fulfillment to a planned action. From a planned action to seeking opportunity. From seeking opportunity to a performed act. From a performed act to a repeated action. From a repeated action to a habit. From a habit to slavery. And we become slaves of sin. See, that's generally a pattern of sin. You get a temptation. Ooh, you entertain it. Before you know it, and you're a slave of that sin now. And so David's prayer, David's song is keep back your servant also from presumptuous. That stuff I know about. Keep me back from it. Protect me from it. Let them, all that stuff I battle with within my thought life and, and, I, and I find it hard to exercise my will and all that stuff. Let them, let that stuff not have dominion over me. Lord, help me. He's crying out. Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, but you are, because you are not under law, but you are under grace. See, David couldn't cry that. He was still under the law. So David's crying out, and his refrain is like, cleanse me, keep me. God, only you can do this. And then he says, then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. And we know that only God can make us blameless, right? And he cannot, he's the only one who can make us blameless because Jesus took the blame. He's the one who hung on the tree, right? Only Christ can keep us from great transgression. And so, after David said this about the two books of creation, the two books, one of creation, sorry, one of God's word, you know, he, he ends with the final verse and he, he leaves us with the thought, he leaves us with the challenge. The thought and the challenge, which is, not Boniem, but <laughs> let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So it doesn't matter sort of like, you know, the words of your mouth to your friends your family, 
you know, the words of your mouth to your work colleagues, I mean, that has no weight. The words of your mouth and the meditations <coughs> of your heart, because God knows, he knows if we're joking or not, he knows if we're hypocrites, mm -hmm. if we're playing a game. Let them be acceptable in, in your sight, in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength, my rock, my redeemer. And so we have to ask ourselves the question if we're, if we're big enough and bold enough to accept it. Are the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart acceptable in God's sight? You know, as we roll through the hours of the day, you know, could we say, yep, that thought's acceptable in God's sight. Yep, that thought's acceptable in God's sight. Yep, this conversation I'm having with such and such a person, acceptable in God's sight. God wouldn't have a problem with this conversation. Or do you know you're having a conversation, you're getting that check. Oh, I shouldn't be saying this, you know. It's like, oh, maybe this should be a private. Maybe I should go to my brother and sister and talk to them about it. I'm opposed to talking to my brethren or sistering. Matthew 18. See? It's all that stuff. Is our, the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart accepting God's sight? If not, there needs to be change. And we have a 1 John 1 9 for that, right? That we confess our sins and he is faithful and just to, to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There needs to be change. There needs to be repentance, which only Christ can offer because he wants to be our strength and he is our redeemer. And that gives us thoughts about, um, I'm sure it's the book of Ruth, right? Boaz, our kingsman redeemer. Yes, our kingsman redeemer. And um, the, to redeem something, you know, you have to pay, you get it back, right? It was yours and you've redeemed it. Again, it's the pictures of being redeemed back unto God, right? So, um, so yes, that the words and the meditations be acceptable in God's sight. Oh, oh, Lord. <laughs> All right, we're going to do that one more time now, right? You got the words in your Bible. <laughs> we're going to say, sing with conviction. Let the words of my mouth and the of my heart be acceptable in your sight, oh, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we want to thank you for your words. We thank you, Lord, that we can be encouraged, we can be inspired, Lord. And um, Lord, I just pray that we can use your word today to, to really springboard us into the, the coming week. And Lord, if we were of the mindset where we didn't really look up into the sky, Lord, and think about the heavens declaring your glory, Lord, and maybe we'll just take a moment to do that this week. Maybe we'll really delve into your work, Lord, and get more understanding, more knowledge about who you are, Lord, and how you're working within our lives, Lord. Help us, Lord. Provoke us. Prompt us, Lord, to be doers of your word, to be seekers of the truth, to be, yeah, um, all that you want us to be, Lord Jesus. And so we just thank you for today. Continue to be blessed. Uh, help us, you, you know, just be with us as we fellowship with each other, Lord. And, um, yeah, we just thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we share the grace?